Spesco Homemakers, uh, Spesco Homemakers, yes, yeah, I've got that on my notes here to talk to you about. Spesco Historical Society, and um, this evening, obviously, we have a great presentation for you tonight. Um, a couple of notes beforehand. First of all, as always, I'd like to thank all of our, our entire Historical Society for a great job tonight. Everybody setting up and getting ready. Thank you. Um, September 23rd, it will be our next presentation here, and that will be the homemakers. Uh, they're going to do a whole, I believe, an hour-ish of, of a whole lot of very interesting things. November 11th, we're going to do a veterans program. Uh, so if you're interested, you know, come into that one. That'll be on the 11th. Over here by the punch, there's a picture over there that says Lily Bay Orchestra on it. And no one knows who they are. The picture was donated... I don't know, Ginny got it somewhere. Picture was donated by someone, and we don't, no one recognizes anybody in it. If you would take a peek at the picture, see if you recognize anyone, and, and tell one of us a name if you know, that would be very helpful. We would really like that. I would like to introduce uh, a longtime Glidden Drive resident who's the surviving member of a team of two with uh, Bill Fairfield, who started the Glidden Drive Estates in the 19, early 1960s, and he's been quite instrumental in uh, uh, setting up the uh, Dunes Park, so he's going to tell us all about that. Without further ado, John Brogan. That's a very pleasant welcome. I see some familiar faces out there, Rod Bone, who, who used to terrorize me as a kid. Yes. Um, the, I'll give you first a little background on me. I'm 77 years old. I spent, Green Bay as my home was all my life. But I spent every summer, virtually from 1938 on, on, on the lakeside, in, in, in the quiet side. And uh, my, because my father had a, had a interest in the shipyard, he was one of the shareholders of the Latham Smith Shipyard. And during the war, it was another story. I mean, uh, those of us who were old enough to remember it, he used to wait every day for Ed Wester's son come by with the ice, for the ice, <laughs> and there was no power out here. Well, there was no power on Lake Forest Park until 55, and there was some power on Golden Drive in, in the war years, but nothing wasn't completely put through because of the copper rationing during the war. This. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, well, <clears throat> I'm a little bit hoarse here. Okay, that's fine. Right. Keep talking, ignore me. The, uh, that's me. <laughs> the, I'm, my notes are, uh, I, I wrote them, so it's hard to read. <laughs> um, before we get into this, I think I'd like to cover briefly a bit of history as to land tenure in Wisconsin. It is somewhat unique in that we're the last state to become a, a territory to become a state out of the um, Northwest Ordinance. And when the government uh, took out of the territory, when the federal government and made states, these five states, on, that they, that they uh, won during the revolution. The federal government did this. They said, well, we want to clear off all the Indian claims, all of the recognized land tenure before we got here, and uh, other benefices that, that we want to give land to, uh, you, 
one of the land grant colleges was Madison. That left of the 35 million acres in Wisconsin, about 30 million. The federal government said, we'll sell 20, and here is 10 to the state. You sell that and set up a internal improvements, roads, get a government going, set up the counties, and so forth. As a consequence, coming into the 20th century, virtually everything was sold. There was zero parks, zero public open lands. Everything was private lands. After that, uh, after the loggers got through, and, and I might, there's, there's a, <laughs> did any of you people ever hear of the round section? Well, the section is of these squares pointed out here, that's 640 acres. But what, and they sold, the state and the federal government sold that land for a dollar, dollar 25 cents an acre. So what happened was a thousand acres would buy you a section, a square mile. <laughs> well, in the pineries, not here, but in the pineries of Wisconsin, the northern one-third, it occurred to some very sharp people that they could, if they could scrape together a bunch of partners and put up a thousand dollars in cash and hire a, a timber crew and locate the land, they could buy that for a thousand dollars. And of course they did. And then they moved the camp in there. And it never, I mean, there was no roads or anything as there is today. So that when the lumberjacks were in there, they had a, a bunkhouse and a cookhouse and, a, and the Bull of the Woods office. And uh, lo and behold, they didn't buy that section in an area that is totally bereft of timber. They bought that section where there was that primary white pine, and then after they cleared that section off, they would cut the four sections around it. That was the public's property, of course, but Uncle Sam didn't have anybody there watching that they go over the boundary, and so a round section was, you cut around it. <laughs> See? You clear off yours and then work like hell to cut the other. Well, that was a consequence of the last, we, we settled, the federal government settled with the 13 tribes and the French land claims in Green Bay and uh, Prairie du Chien, but everything else was sold. And so there was no recreational land until, there wasn't, a, there wasn't a state park until we got shamed into one. The Swedes in Minnesota thought that that land up around the headwaters of the St. Croix was very attractive. And so they, they put their side in a, in a park to preserve it. And Wisconsin didn't see the need for parks. And so a number of people went down and raised hell with the legislature, and a couple of years later, uh, Wisconsin voted the money for its first park. Between then and 1962, we went from one park to 13 in the state, and the state had under park and resource management, uh, about 300,000 acres. Uh, Gaylord Nelson, who I served on his staff, uh, had an idea that he put a one cent tax on cigarettes and started the ORAP, or Stewardship Program, which has been responsible for, in this county, uh, Whitefish Bay Dunes, Rock Island, 
Newport and bought up the inholdings of Peninsula Park, which were, were there until the 60s. We now have recreational lands that the state has of approximately 2 million. So it's quite a leap in 50 years, but it's, it's proven out very, very attractive because tourism is the second or third largest in business in the state. The period of the turn of the century in, from 1899 to 1934 was Teddy Roosevelt was president and he provided the leadership to acquire public lands for recreational purposes. And it was easy for Teddy because west of the Mississippi, they didn't act like Wisconsin. They didn't sell, it was for sale, but so much the land nobody was taking. And so there, there's an agency of state government, or federal government, which people in the Midwest don't know anything about. And people out in the West get frothy mobbed and crazy about it, and that's called the BLM, Bureau of Land Management. So Teddy got all these beautiful areas out West, and it wasn't hard for him to make national parks. He just declared it. They already owned the land. And so they just, and he had a conference in 1903 with every governor of the state, uh, of every state in the country, and gave him a solid one week of Teddy. <laughs> I mean, he was, uh, you know, and he was up there pounding his hands and telling them that they ought to have parks. Well, that was a strange concept to a lot of, a lot of those governors. But he then sent a fellow by the name of Gilbert Pinchot, who was Secretary of the Interior. And naturally, the Bureau of Land Management is under the Secretary of Interior. But he sent him out around the country to locate areas that would fit Teddy's idea of a national park. And uh, he came, came, went all over the country locating these scenic sites. And, and Pinchot came to the Midwest and, well, the job was, here's, the lake, here's Lake Michigan. What are we going to do with this? Well, Pinchot recommended to the president three sites on Lake Michigan. One of them was the Sleeping Bear Dunes, 58 miles across over in Michigan. Second one was the Indiana Dunes in northern Indiana next to Chicago. And the third one was the shorefront in the town of Sebastopol. Well, needless to say, they got the money for, for, for Michigan, and that's a national park today. They didn't buy the land in Indiana and in the Michigan, uh, the Indiana Dunes. So that, had, that turned into being developed. A portion of it uh, finally was made a, a national park when Paul Douglas of Illinois said it, it ought to be something open to everybody. However, the, the third spot also didn't get bought, but it didn't get that developed. Suddenly on the scene comes a guy by the name of Orrin Glidden. And he's a realtor and a pretty bright guy in Chicago. And he arranges to get a silent partner who, who turned out to be Sam Insel, uh, who started his life as a clerk for Thomas Alva Edison and wound up 
dressing like a woman and jumping on a plane and flying away from prosecution to Sweden. He wound up owning almost all of the utilities in the Midwest and South and put together a great financial scheme that collapsed and the government was after Sam, so he left. Well, he was, at one time, one of the wealthiest people in the country. The point is that Glidden, with Insel's backing, developed something in the dunes called Long Beach, Indiana. So it's a whole community down there. And they made a ton of money real quick because the middle class of Chicago, who had made money during World War I and got prosperous, wanted to do something on the weekends with the kids and the father and so forth. After that, in the early to mid-20s, Insel and Glidden came up here to Door County and started to develop, they at one time bought uh, Chambers Island <laughs> and uh, they were going to put a ditch into Lake Mackesy and they, they hired my grandfather and he went in there and shot the levels and stuff and he came out and he said to Glidden and Insel, he said, we can do it but you just have a mud puddle there. <laughs> because the lake is higher than the bay, and it would just drain out. So they went on and developed Point Beach over in Egg Harbor, set property <coughs> on the inner part of the harbor and then uh, south. And for some reason, Glidden went on his own. And in 1928, he got a series of options and bought in 29 9,000 acres. In fact, almost everything you see in purple here. Except for a few homes in, um, in, in Whitefish Bay, the little unincorporated village. That was a settlement it was mostly uh, just a few families, millers, loungers, Elise, they were fishermen. Uh, and uh, they had their boats down there at the creek, if you remember that. And everything else north and south of them was bought by Glidden. Now that goes to that half of Clark's Lake, Shower Park, skipped Whitefish, and right down to what we down to the south end of Glidden Drive. He started to put the roads in, 29, 30, and the depression hit, and the crash came, and he passed away in 32 or 3, broke. And the judge that was probating what was left of his estate called on the senior creditors. Nothing, the same thing would happen today uh, in a bankruptcy. The judge, probate judge, said, well, now, I rule that the uh, Schmoke Ice and Coal Company of Michigan City, Indiana, who put the roads in here, has a mechanics lien senior to any borrowing from the banks. And I've determined that of the 9,000 acres and the roads in, or, you know, this, along, the, along the shore, that the Schmokes are due half of it. And so they asked the Schmoke brothers to stand up and say, which half do you want? And they put their heads together and said, the south half. They said, all right, that's mechanics leans out of the way. For the north half, well, it turned out that there were, there was one group of three people, Hanson, Lyons, and Reynolds, that all happened to be directors of the Pulaski State Bank, and they put a bid on half of the north half, including Clark's Lake. 
judge said, well, well, that's gone. And then there was a gentleman who lived into his late 90s, Charlie Katie, who bought the southern part. So that's how this land got cut up. Well, Hanson, Lyons, and Reynolds sold off all the warm water lots on Clark Lake. But they, John Reynolds was the father of the, of the Governor Reynolds. He was Attorney General, and he was a better politician than he was a lawyer. And this has some relevance to what we're talking about tonight. He never put that ownership into a corporation. Therefore, when after World War II, when this land could get bought, every one of the three partners were dead and their children and grandchildren held title in undivided one sixteenth. <laughs> well, you, I think you, we all know that you couldn't, it'd be hard to get your grandson to agree to something uh, because his wife said, no, it's worth more than that. <laughs> but, but to get 16 people to, you know, ah. So it's, it, the land sat there from World War II until the late 60s, early 70s, rather, early 70s. And by that time, uh, I had developed with Fairfield the southern half of the that part that's called Wooden, Wooden Drive. And we bought, I bought that from Ewald in 1963. But, but the north half just couldn't be sold to anybody. And Charlie sold, Charlie Katie sold some of his land. So as a consequence, the location that Pinchot at the turn of the century cited was a unique piece of property that ought to be saved for the public it was almost all gone. There was about 850 acres. 450 of those 850 were all shorefront. And that was the Hanson, Lyons, and Reynolds tribe. So the state had this ORAP money at the time and um, was interested in acquiring that for at least a day use park, not a big camping park. And uh, they couldn't come to any agreement with price. Well, you know, the state couldn't. They, you know, 16 people. <laughs> so rarely, and, and I mean very rarely, in the state of Wisconsin, Department of Natural Resources at that time had the power of condemnation. So we, we resolved this whole piece of business by going to condemnation on the property, and we then acquired legal title to it. Because we had little pieces of property up here, but not dealing with the big piece, and the staff kept, kept buying 10 acres here and 50 acres there and so forth. There wasn't anything big enough to put up a sign saying State Park, and by that time we had over a half a million dollars into it. And so I was on the board in favor of a park, and I, but I said to the staff, I said, you, don't you ever come up here with another 20-acre pie? You, you deal with the big piece or we're, or we're going to sell everything else and put it in some other park. And um, staff accepted that reluctantly. And so they dealt with the big piece. And by 1979, uh, the condemnation came through, came through and that that is how 9,000 acres shrunk down to 850. Uh, and that's how Roosevelt's uh, wish came true only a half a century later, 75 years later. The, the 
One of the problems with land in Door County is that it wasn't attractive like Peshigo in the, in the pineries. White pine naturally grew only in sand because it has a deep taproot. Hardwoods grow in shallow soil. Well, I don't have to tell anybody in this audience how shallow the soil is, except for a couple of areas around here, Jackson, Port, you know. And uh, our pines got cut off coterminous with the uh, Mrs. O'Leary's cow in Chicago. They really needed a, needed a lot of pine, pine to rebuild the city. And so uh, this was the most convenient pine, source of pine in the Great Lakes. It was the shortest haul and so forth. That's why that any of you boaters that have lost your lures over there, uh, trolling over in Jacksonport have found that that, that that dock is there, about oh, half a mile out, but you can't see it. <laughs> All the timbers are there, but the top of it. And so that's, that was a major port for clearing off what little pine we had here. And unlike some of the other areas of the state, the only thing we had up here beyond the pine, the small amount of pine, was the hardwoods on very shallow soil. So this was not primary land to, to buy and, and set up a farm, even if you only cost you a uh, hundred bucks for a 40. I mean, my great grandfather came from Ireland and he came out to look for land out here and decided to be in, to go into southern Brown County. There's, you know, a hundred feet of clay and lots of things to grow on. Well, in the case of the ownership, that's how it transferred. That's what became of it. And the, the way that it developed was that in 1963, I ran into, I, I had known Ewald, I used to be a stockbroker. And I was there one night and I had a good year in 64. 62, 63 in the market, and I thought I'd come up and buy a thousand feet someplace. Well, I didn't. That night, by the time Mr. Lauser came in and gave Ewald tax bill for all this back land and the stuff that he had left on the shore, uh, it was reassessed. And uh, the assessed value was $162,000. Poor old Lebet, you know, his wife, if any of you knew her. She, Ewald was sitting there in his wheelchair chewing on his cigar and saying, why to Lauscher he starts arguing with Mr. Lauscher, who really is just a town treasurer, that's all. And he said, by God, he said, this thing ain't worth a hundred thousand. And he said, I'd sell it all for a hundred thousand. And Babette raised her hand and said, Ewald, Ewald, I could tell you, we could live like kings. Like kings, he go. So I looked out of my parka and said, how about me? And that's where it ended. I mean, we closed it and I paid $100,000 for 7,200 feet of rock shore front and 20,000 feet of inland property. And I think we've been fairly well received I, uh, since then. I, I don't think anybody's lost a penny. We first started to sell that land at 35 a foot for the shorefront and uh, $9 for the inland. <laughs> but uh, that was how this land devolved with that one instance of Teddy Roosevelt thinking that this was absolutely the right place to have a national park in Wisconsin. I thank you very much.
And if there are any questions, I would be pleased to answer them. Is there, is there any question about, a gentleman called me when, he, when this was announced and he said, he, he talked to me about my, my position on condemnation. Well, you know, you, you come to a point where the department want, doesn't want to use that power that it had. But, you know, if some landowner owns a 40 acres it's blocking a highway, I should think that they, there's a provision in, in the law of every state that says if you go through the legal process of condemnation and getting a fair price uh, for the public good, there's got to be a public good on it. Yeah? How did the county come to uh, get the Cape Point property? Yeah, oh, that, that's a neat story. <laughs> There were a lot of people that were, uh, in the war years, there was 8,300 people. Mind you, Sturgeon Bay was only seven. 8,300 people working at Smith alone, and there were four other shipyards. So there was people living in ditches and houses and, and sheds and farms, and, you know, commuting from Marinette. Well, in the middle of the war, there was precious little um, swimming, and they had a couple of hot summers, and so a lot of a lot of those shipyard workers were bringing their families to swim at Cave Point, and one person almost drowned and two did. Well. John Reynolds Sr., the former Attorney General, understood the law well enough to know that if you were maintaining a public nuisance, an attractive nuisance, you were liable <laughs> for somebody injuring themselves on it. Well, dead is pretty well injured. And, <laughs> and so there was some interest at that time uh, the, uh, in the late 30s, Door County uh, acquired these overlooks, you know, up, up in northern Door County at Ellison Bay and uh, Death's Door and so forth. And John Slyfellow figured there would be uh, this attractive piece of property available at very reasonable <laughs> prices. <laughs> And so, and so the county bought the 20 acres that surround Cave Point. And uh, when the state acquired all the property around Cave Point, uh, the county said, no, we're going to keep it as a non-pay area for the public. And um, so... That's why it isn't incorporated in Whitefish Bay Dunes, because the law also says you can't condemn against a county. You, the state cannot use that power against it because it's already in the public. Is that? No. I'm curious about where um Glidden got his money. Was that related to the Glidden Paint Company in Ohio? No, I don't know, other than he was smart enough to hook up with Sam. And Sam was one clever cookie. I mean, he started his life in England and then worked for, as, a, as a gopher for Tom, Thomas Edison. But he was a national-born promoter. And what he, what he did in World War II is he convinced the states of Indiana and Illinois to give him eminent rights of eminent domain so far as building a right-of-way for a railroad from Chicago to um, South Bend. 
was called the South Shore Railroad. <laughs> and there never was, I mean, the people who invested in it lost everything because there never was any economic reason for a commuter train from South Shore, from, you know, from the lake in, Mo in Chicago, down to Notre Dame. But it went right through the dunes and right past this wonderful bunch of sand that Glidden went and told him, you be my silent partner and we'll make a ton of money and split it between the two of us <laughs> and not the shareholders. So that, that's, how, that's how he got involved. Yeah. Um, question about the proposed golf course development. From what I understand, the hitching post was supposed to be the clubhouse for a golf course? It was. If you talk to some of the old Georges, it, as I understand it, in the 30s, see what Ewald did is he worked for his brothers. He didn't own any of this land. So he he owned. No, no, okay. no, no. He was the third brother and, a, okay. and the kid. He ran the job. Uh, the. He bought from family that land of 100 and 200 odd acres up there around the lodge. And uh, Babette ran the lodge and did the cooking and the laundry and everything else. And I understand that at one time they carved a couple of, of greens into the, into the woods out there. That's what Mr. Mr. George told me that one time. But the, uh, that's, that was asking too much of Tommy. <laughs> yeah. yeah, could you elaborate a little bit about uh, the layout on Linden Drive and that, and that smoke drive was part of the, the, the road to be for the back lots, but it never got developed? That's right. We had to make that decision about putting that road in, and we thought that that was just silly. Glidden did that. Glidden plotted Schmoke Drive, Glidden Drive, back lots, shore lots, from Westers, or from the south end of the drive, up to uh, White Pine. And, yeah, and then beyond that, it was just acreage. So that was Glidden's plan down here that uh, we didn't pursue. The other thing is that uh, long, narrow lots in, in the Indiana dunes <laughs> provided the ability of people to put a cabin on the first lot, a cabin back, and one, and one, three or four deep. And they didn't want that here, so they didn't make the lots deep. They made the lots 200 feet. And uh, Ewald would, would only sell two lots on the water, or two lots on the inland side. So we followed that, and then in the, in the area that we had, that it was, we didn't plant it, we did it by meets and bounds, and cut those lots into two-acre two parcel, acre-and-a-half, two-acre parcel. Yes? Can you also speak to the um, little water access roads that seem to kind of run? Yeah. Uh, there is a, uh, I was just talking to Laddie about this. There's a state law that says that if you um, have so, uh, so many lots along the shore, you can't, you have to, you have to, this is back in the 20s, you have to include in that plat before it's approved an access every half mile. And what those accesses at the southern part of the drive are is one out lot, 60 feet wide, and then delineated the next 60 feet north and the next 50 
60 feet south is for, for the public use. And as the land, the land that I bought was not sand, it was all rock. And so we kept on with that concept of access to provide walking access to the shore. And those are the accesses that are on the northern end of the drive. Now, that, that promoted, we hoped, and it turned out, attractive housing and development on the inland side if you could have access to the, to the water. There's one throwback to this, if you'll pardon me. <laughs> it goes back to the Treaty of Genf. Uh, these five states are under, under obligation that came between the French and the British to end the War of 1757. And that was, the French cleverly said to the Brits, look, if you want to get anything out of this territory that you've won, You'd better not have individuals being able to own streams. That the public, that the, that the water should be the property of everyone. And that means water under any stream that's navigable. You could float, float along it. So the Brits signed that, and we, and when our, our people were at the Treaty of Paris, they agreed. As a consequence, you have the trust doctrine, and that has caused no amount of aggravation because the public owns the land underneath the water, and it had, the, the riparian owner has the right use, but so does the public if he's in the water. You know, so you can't be... Uh, so whatever you pay for shorefront, it, it, it comes with that caveat in these five states. No other states in the Union have that. But we've got that uh, obligation that the French negotiated with the Brits in the Treaty of Genf. Treaty of Paris. Yeah, then the Treaty of Paris. First the Treaty of Genf and then Paris because there's an interesting thing that you need to go into the reasons for it that I became aware of some years ago. You know, the University of Texas and its various campuses has a lot of money. That's because somebody ruled out there that all the oil that's under that land is owned by the university. And I, and that's, Not the that's, whole state, but... Yeah. yeah. So it's really a yeah. parallel kind of thing. Maybe it went back and... Historically, the, uh, I'm, I'm too old to see this thing play out. But I was in Texas uh, this last spring. And we were staying in Austin, and then I, I picked up a paper, and I said, this can't be true. Apparently, the state of the, the Supreme Court of the state of Texas has ruled that all groundwater is to be treated like oil. Because if it's under your property, you can pump it till it's dry. It's all yours. And if it affects the oil in the guy down the road, too bad, you got there first, you're pumped like hell. Well, they ruled that to be, the, they ruled that to apply to water. <laughs> Well, there are, right now, there are water districts throughout Texas that allocate, because water is precious, they allocate the usage not based on who owns what where. It's just if, you're, if you want to use groundwater and you're in this aquifer area, you're limited to this much. And they took the caps off. Well, what's going to happen to this San Antonio? You know, <laughs> It's just, it, it's, uh, they, 
they've stuck their foot in their cow pie. <laughs> yes, sir. Could you talk about your partner, Fairfield? Could you speak about your partner, Fairfield? Yeah. He was writing a book uh, and living at my mother's cabin, which had been a duck hunting shack for dad. And uh, I came back that night and I said, do you want half of this? And he said, what's that going to take? I said, oh, I agreed to 25,000 down payments, so you've got to come up with 12,500. And he started mussing around and said, I inherited about $9,300 from my grandfather. And I said, well, I'll go back and ask you all to reduce the down payment. <laughs> and, and that's how he became a partner. I later sold out my interest to him, though I retained 2,000 feet of shorefront, and then developed Moonlight Bay. And I was all out of the real estate business by 1970. So, did something real crazy, I bought a bank. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, is there something over here? Okay, well, thank you very much for being attentive. Yeah. Great talk, Mark. No, that's okay. Does it, I know that there's there has has been and it maybe still is um, Indian artifacts and up and down the lake. Does does that fact have any? Um, the Indians have any claim because of that that there are things set up and. I have never, uh, when I was on the board and we bought that property, that was the time that the lake was coming up and it hit a high in 84. And uh, when the lake was coming up and we were in the middle of this legal fight, some of the dunes sloughed off and here were some buried, buried Indians. The most I've... Uh, heard about is that no tribe particularly claimed that area, but, the, but some of the tribes, the reason it's called Whitefish Bay is because they could do trap nets out of, out of twine and twigs and sink them the, and the whitefish would come along and then go into the net or uh, in the pot. I understand that the Indians would use this area seasonally, like all of us. They would c come here in the summertime, they would fish and smoke the fish to preserve it, and then go back to whatever tribal area they came from. But uh, that's, that's the only Indian claim on it. Yes, sir. Both families came to own a lot of that property in there before you came along. Maybe I wasn't clear on that. The Schmoke family had a construction company as part of their ice and coal business in Michigan City. And they put the roads in the dunes, which is some sort of a trick, I can tell you, in Indiana. And so when Glidden came up here, he hired the same German family who m moved up from Michigan City, Indiana, and their younger brother was Ewald. And he, he was the superintendent of the job that eventually created the roads up to Shower Park. So the judge, when Glidden passed away, and to resolve his estate, the Schmokes had the mechanics lien. They had a prior lien to any other creditor. And the judge said, I determine you get half. Now, which half do you want? And Ewald told me, he said, we chose the half that, ha that, that the roads pretty well stayed in. He said, up there, <laughs> the roads used to wash out, you know in high water, so that's, that's how it is. Okay.
Thanks, John. That was wonderful. I just wanted to tell everyone that uh, these maps along the uh, side were donated to the Historical Society by Mary Ann Miller from Whitefish Bay. I don't know where she got them, but uh, they are, let's see, I don't know if any of them are, are uh, John's development, but they precede that. Is there one there that's that? Um, the 1937 plat, it's drawn out beautifully big, too big to scan and and use that way. So please take a look at those. We'll try to preserve them best we can. One more hand for John Jordan.